Attention, please. Eastern Airlines Flight 19, now ready for departure. Welcome aboard the Walt Disney World Express Monorail. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're entering the vacation kingdom of the world. There's enough land here to hold all the ideas and plans we could possibly imagine. We call it Epcot. It will be our experimental prototype city of tomorrow. Welcome to another episode of the Retro Disney World Podcast. Taking you back to the vacation kingdom of the world, the way it was, and the way it is in your memories. Welcome back to episode five of the Retro Disney World podcast. This episode is titled Stubborn Donkey, and we'll be taking you back to the world of motion in Epcot Center. And uh, with me tonight, as always, is JT, Howe, and Brian. Welcome to the episode, guys. Hello, hello. hello everybody. Everybody's back. So... Um, have a little note here to uh, get us started here before we start off. Um, this is a note of, a, of dedication. I'm going to dedicate this episode. Uh, last Monday, uh, my wife's grandmother, uh, matriarch of a very large Italian family, passed away. And um, very ironic that uh, as she was going through the photos, uh, you know, before the service and after the service, I started looking through some of the uh, piles and and lo and behold, I looked down, and, and there's a photo of, uh, of Philomena, uh, my wife's grandmother, sitting next to her uh, late husband, Luigi. And um, where are they? None other than in the front front of the car of World of Motion. Uh, they've got their hands up, they're waving. Luigi's sitting there with, a, a, a one, obviously, a Walt Disney World Epcot bag, the pink and orange color back then. And... Um, I thought that was really kind of ironic that one of the pictures that we found was of was of her. So this episode is dedicated both to Philomena and Luigi, who um, who we lost over the years, and and Philomena, who we lost uh, just this past Monday. So uh, with that said, uh, we're going to move on now and uh, get going on the podcast. Um, first and foremost is that we had a record level uh, record number of downloads this month uh, we smashed all records uh, for the last uh, podcast episode four and uh, we had the largest feedback and really really great response so uh, for all of our listeners out there we appreciate the continued uh, support um, and and if you can uh, please do uh, try to drop us a, a review on iTunes if you, if you have the time and the opportunity to do that would be great um, as always if you have any questions you can reach us at podcast at retro disney world.com so uh keep the downloads and the subscriptions coming and we're going to keep on making these uh episodes for you so we got a jam-packed episode uh this is world of motion over in epcot and uh i'm gonna let uh how kind of kick us off here and and brian and, and jt you guys unfortunately never rode world of motion other than no, no i wrote it Oh, you did. That's right. That's right. I, I wrote it in 88 and 95. All right. All right. So, JT, you had to put your virtual reality goggles on in front of YouTube, right? Yes, I watched. I learned. And I'm, yeah, well, I'm catching up with you guys. So I'll be asking questions this time. Uh, there we go. You p- poke the bear. There go. You yes. got it. All right. So, Hal, give us a little of the, uh, the background here, and, and uh, we'll get into a lot of the stats and then all the different show scenes. There was so much to go over. Oh, it's, it was an absolutely titanically sized uh, pavilion. Um, a, as a throwback to the to sixty four, um, as we talked about last week, it was one of the one of the first uh, pavilions that was worked on um, um, when they planned Epcot Center, and uh, in fact, it was the very first pavilion to get officially sponsored. Um, GM was so, I guess, angry at being put number two at the 64-year-old World's, World's Fair by what Disney did with Ford. Um, they signed up um, as soon as Epcot <laughs> became a thing. So um, they were in there from the beginning. It went through a couple of de- design phases. Um, there was a very early one that had um, cars. Um, it was going to be two rides, an Omnimover ride on the inside, and then an actual ride that you would be able to ride in cars on the outside. As time went on, that condensed down to the version that we saw today. So that was uh, going to be very similar to the Ford Pavilion then, huh? In, yeah, I in think so. In actual cars? 
I think it was so impressive um, of an idea to put people inside of the car. Um, that, that seems like a very natural thing to do. Right. And in, in fact, in the end, they ended up keeping that element um, at the end of Trans Center, letting you get into cars in the showroom. But but we'll get there. But I'd, I'd say definitely that concept of being able to walk up to the pavilion and see some kind of vehicle in motion as you approached it carried through into the final design, um, just with omni movers in, instead of cars. Right, right. So, um, so it was, as I talk about the staggering size, it's like I happened to pull some stats. So, uh, in this show, there were 107 audio animatronic human figures, 73 animals. <laughs> um, <they're>, sorry. <laughs> we have a, we have a loose dog in the studio. He wanted, <laughs> wanted the car ride. He's mad. It didn't happen. I apologize, folks. Dogs the, riding the, the in ride, cars. The ride of World of Motion has stopped momentarily while we clear an obstruction on the Omni Queenie, Dog's lap. Leave trucks. him alone. He might be a good customer of GE. <laughs> or RCA. The, the ride had almost as many animals as people. So yeah, the, almost. The, yeah. Yeah. the timing of that was perfect. So, yeah. um, um, thir- 33 <laughs> animated props. <laughs> Uh, 23 full scale sets, uh, 16 uh, cars, uh, actual cars, not omni- yeah, actual vehicles. cars right, inside, cars. plus you know, airplanes, trains, like uh, just about every kind of vehicle imaginable. Um, and it had a theoretical hourly capacity of um, 3,240 people, which is actually staggering. Yeah, that's I mean, that's that is a big big ride do we know what the length that the, like the, the total physical length of all the omni movers put together like how 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 far that went around um yes actually i will look that up while i while i work on the next two stats there um go. there were 141 cars um including three cars that were built for wheelchair vehicles so they were just kind of like flat platforms that you could roll three wheelchairs on at a time um, but it was wheelchair accessible as far back as 82. So that was, I think Epcot was really the first park that was set up with wheelchairs in mind um, right, right. compared to the other ones. Were the I mean, cars, think about the normal cars. Were they like spaceship Earth style or were they different? Looking? Um, very similar to um, to what was in Journey into Imagination. Okay. So kind of a wedge shape with three seats in the front and three seats in the back. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at the picture of, of Luigi and, and Philomena here, and they weren't tiered uh, stadium style, so to speak, like Journey into Imagination that I recall, at least that I can see in this picture, right? Because Journey Imagination is more of a, a step. The people in the back are slightly raised from the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, I mean, they're very similar, but probably not, uh, not exact. Right. So when you go over those notes there, how I mean, 141 cars at six people each. I mean, just quick math. That's that's nearly 850, not including the handicap. That's quite a, a number of people in the ride at at one, you know. Given. Yeah, like all the Epcot attractions. I mean, really, they were all built to be extremely high capacity because I mean, honestly, there were there were only a few of them, right? So right. there was only a handful of attractions, so you didn't have. Uh, as many opportunities for a bunch of little attractions to eat people like uh, like the other ones. Just, okay, so the track length was 1,749 feet. Wow. Jeez. I was so, not cut down like Tomorrowland Speedway either. No, <laughs> no. It did not change length over the no, years. You got so. the full experience. <laughs> the full experience. Hey, yeah. You've got here, they had spare vehicles, and then the, the ride time was an impressive 15 minutes and 44 seconds, of which... You know, we'll talk about later. I mean, every scene changed. There was a lot of uh, the, the tunnels we're going to get to, but that's that's a hefty time. I mean, that's a, yeah. I mean, if you compare it to, to Horizons and Spaceship Earth, which you know, when I was there, that those were my three must dos. I put them all three of them right in the same category and love them all. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely up there. Yeah, and uh, the the one thing that's that's good to to try to remember is that World of Motion was the name of the pavilion, and it was really divided into two sections. So one was the was the Omni Mover ride, the the travel through time, which was called It's Fun to Be Free, and then the Trans Center was the exhibit area at the end of it where GM could show off a bunch of their technology. How many so, people ever picked up on that? I you know that was one of those things. I think everyone just called the well, ride World of Motion. Yeah, I think everybody, right. I, I think even the guidebooks listed it as World, World of, yeah. of Motion. <laughs> I mean, if you figure Journey to the Mag- Journey to Imagination was you know two separate things, but the main ride was still. Yeah. But yeah, that, it's it's interesting. So now was the Trans Center? Is that if we look at it today? Is that where the cars are at? Is that the similar? area you know like at the end of test track is that or did yes that, yes yeah. it would be i believe it would be the same so uh if you picture that that circle sort of mm-hmm. like as a pie 
Yeah. And the entrance is kind of like the first wedge. And so the wedge to the right hand side would have been the trance center. Right. And the wedge on the and, left was the was the original queue area, which I remember being carpeted and nothing going on. Yeah, that was <laughs> one of the we can jump right into the queue. That that was probably one of the most boring yeah. queues ever. If, what was uh, the wait like? Was it really busy, or did it well, always sometimes move? it they had? I remember in the concrete outside, they had the pillars uh, that they, they could put up. So not only would you be in ropes on the concrete, you'd then be in ropes underneath the area that you would come out and go up, which was tiled, right? How it was like a blue or red tile yeah, yep. or something. Mm-hmm. You would then snake through there. Then once you got inside. There was a a switch back back and forth, and then there was a final ramp, I believe, if I remember correctly, going up to the That's left, right. and then to the right is where you'd finally um, get on the the, the Omni movers that would then take you outside. Yeah. So, so, what was your recollection like? Average wait time, like half hour, or just depended on the season? Or I have I have a video from oh I want to say like eighty six, eighty eight, and I would guesstimate from the crowds from the monorail, I I would put put the wait time easily at 45 to an hour and 15. Wow. Yeah. Early, early years. Definitely. As, yeah. as you got into the nineties, like it became a walk on, but in the old days, it was exceedingly crowded. Right. As, as were all the future world pavilions. It's, it's actually kind of interesting. There's been a flip flop where at that time, future world was way more popular than world showcase. There were a couple, you know, people didn't, there were a couple of things to do back in World Showcase, but it really wasn't the main focus. And today it's the exact opposite. World Showcase is just bonzo crazy and Future World is usually quite empty. And in, or at least yeah. we also have to remember, I mean, this is a little, a little anecdotal information here, but when, when I remember when in the early 80s when Epcot opened, World Showcase opened at the same time and they eventually learned their lesson that nobody's getting back there <laughs> and and uh, i don't remember when that staggered opening time change and we've had staggered closing times as well to push the people back towards illuminations but um it, it show it, it the reason i say that is because it really shows you as how pointed out the pulling power of of these future pavilions and, and what future world really was it's that's where people wanted to be because your know, world showcase didn't have that power yet with um maelstrom wasn't there and and, and morocco wasn't even there years ago yeah, there just weren't many attractions back there. And at, yeah. at that time, people wanted to ride attractions. That's, right. There was no now, fun. There was nothing else. <laughs> yeah. So. We, they didn't, I don't think the culture was as drinking heavy and as into the parties <laughs> as they are today. Right. Well, as we often talk about on here, there there was no lifestyle or local, you know, I go to the parks a hundred times a year type crap. I mean, they didn't exist back then. Right. That's true. So, you went and you tried to get on as many things as you could because right. that was your one chance to go. You went yep. for rides. Yep. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so let me, st- let me jump into one thing that was in the queue that was kind of neat. Cause it, it okay. was a damn empty queue, um, except for some weird, like <laughs> aluminum, like things on the walls. But the one little part of it that was really interesting and neat is as you actually got up that ramp that you mentioned, um, there was a series of speakers that ran across the ceiling uh, and those speakers use the same speaker system that's in the haunted mansion, in the uh, in the hallway, and they played a combination of music. There are probably like five or six variations of "It's Fun to Be Free," and then they would do a sound of a vehicle, like a car or a plane or something, and it would start on one side of the line and go from left to right. Uh, to the other side of the line. So as you were standing there, you got waiting to get on. Finally, you got this feeling of like this thing buzzing over your head. So that was kind of a little neat feature. Um, uh, I'm going to jump in here for a minute. Uh, you were just talking about the view when you were outdoors, right at the beginning of the ride, they'd bring you outdoors and you saw this view overlooking uh, straight ahead to spaceship earth and, and an overview of the future world. I never remember if it's East or West, which side you're on there, but uh, east, side. <laughs> east, there you go. Right. And uh, uh, directly above you, which is still in the pavilion was the GM sponsor lounge for uh, world of motion. So the corporate lounge for private access for GM executives and employees was up there. So they, they got the same view on this wall of windows up in the, up in the uh, lounge, which is still there today. There's still a lounge there today. Um, (laughs) But yeah, the lounge, the lounge was very nice. Brian, you've got photos. You can, might be able to like describe in a little bit more detail. I'm going by memory because I was in there one time, but um, 
the view was absolutely gorgeous. You got to look into Spaceship Earth, as, as Brian mentioned. Uh, and I believe they had photos on the wall. And I can't remember if it was of the ride or if it was of the model of the ride. But they had these huge pictures of the actual attraction inside of the lounge. I mean, they were really, really proud of it. I mean, that's they wanted to show that off in some comfortable couches and, uh, you know, free drinks and stuff. So, yeah, it was and it it's still that it's all been redone. I mean, it looks like a Vegas lounge now in terms of neon lighting and 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 modern stuff. I mean, there's there's you can you can Google it and see inside the place. But uh, the interesting thing to note is it's the only lounge that has stayed uh, corporate sponsored throughout the entire existence of the park. So it's the only one that, other than people like how uh, most people have never seen it or have never had access to it. All the other lounges you've been able to rent when corporate sponsorships uh, fade away um, or yeah, they've opened them up for undiscovered future world tours, that kind of stuff. Uh, but the GM lounge is like the holy grail of corporate lounges because it's the one that's never, ever been available to the public in any way. It's always been reserved for GM employees to this day. Awesome. Interesting. Yeah. Still there. Maybe we can rent it out. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so I guess, so what actually we had one question that, uh, that someone sent us and they wanted to know, uh, if it was meant to be a parody of the history of, of travel and, um, was there reason for the, for the ascent outside? So, um, so the answer is yes, it's, it's a lighthearted look at the history of transportation. That is, that is the main concept of the ride. Um, and we'll get into a lot of detail of, of why that's the case. And, uh, and the whole reason that the ride goes up and around is to get you basically off of the first floor and up onto the second floor. Um, it's a 60 foot tall building, but the entire bottom floor is either Q or Trans Center. So the show all takes place on the second floor. And if you if you compare it to today's test track, um, it's the same thing. The Q is downstairs. Uh, the Trans Center or whatever the heck they call it today is 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 still there. Um, and the, that is the reason that after you do your seatbelt check, you fly up a hill and do a quote unquote hill climb, and that's to get to the second story of the building. So the internals of the of the building, uh, while modified, still retain what from uh, the original uh, ride structure. Yeah. Now, on that note, before I, you know, I'm talking about now, does, if you're in Test Track, have you guys ever ridden Test Track and seen anything that relates to World of Motion at all, uh, or is it all gone? The floor. The floor is still there. Really? (laughs) (laughs) No kidding. I can't, I I don't know if there's anything hidden at all. Can you think of it? I I have not been on the new version of Test Track, but I understand that, uh, in at least one location, the old World of Motion logo yes. is present. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, that's definitely that's definitely there. But I, I don't. Eagle eyed listener needs to just f- spot something and tell us. I'm curious. But yeah, yep. as far as any elements of the show, no, they've been they've been scattered to the four winds. Um, and you have which to we can talk about at the end. But the the old you know the old World of Motion. Each individual scene that we're going to go through here was almost I don't want to call it its own room, but they were. Um, there were scrims and, and walls and different things separating each of them so that one didn't interfere with the other. Uh, yeah. And you know, when you get in test track now, it's just it's just wide open, other than the, yeah. you know the additional hill climb later on. Or um, so, as you mentioned, when you walked up to the pavilion, you could see uh, in the center like omni movers, sort of like snaking up around sort of a tall central column with mirrors. The um, the GM. Uh, uh, VIP lounge was sort of atop that central cutout section. So if you were up in the lounge, you could look out at the crowds uh, and see that going on. And that, as as you took the Omni Mover up around that pillar, that was one of the most iconic photo spots. One of the most you, you'd come out from the cool into the blazing heat <laughs> and then go back in. But you could see Horizon, you could see Universal Energy, Communicore, Spaceship Earth. I I can't remember a time where either myself or somebody else in an Omnimover did not pull a camera out because it was yeah, such it was, a unique it was beautiful. perspective. Yeah. Great. Great. And especially at night too with spaceship earth all, all yep. lit up. So, so yeah, then we, we went in and we had, uh, yeah. So why don't we get into some of those scenes as, as, as you imagine yourself coming outside and, and, and going around the mirrored uh, column and you, you come inside. If I remember correctly, was it their air conditioning vent or air, an air curtain blowing down as you went in? That's right. Yeah, Isn't there, there was, was an air curtain at the door. Yeah. yeah, there was an air curtain. So as you went through, you got this blast of air coming down that would help to keep the cool air inside because it was 
these omni mover vehicles were just continual train going in so there was there was no door there um yep. but and then we had to make kind of like a left-hand turn around the corner to try to get out of the sunlight too because the sunlight would get into there exactly which was really the design very smart to, to get that sunlight out and they had that wall there so yeah uh, and then we come to our very first scene, right? So our very first scene. So from the design perspective, um, the the ride was pretty much put together um, by Mark Davis. So if you're used to the kind of storytelling that D- Mark Davis does in Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, it's very much the same thing here. And uh, actually, Brian has a little bit of uh, a note about where some of the show scenes came from. So the original, I, I think we touched on this at one point, but... Um... Originally, in the Magic Kingdom, <clears throat> before they built Pirates of the Caribbean, there was this Western River expedition that Mark Davis had designed. It was this massive, actually, I think it was three different attractions back in the area where Big Thunder Mountain Railroad and Splash Mountain are now. Uh, and that was shelved a couple years after the Magic Kingdom opened and then permanently shelved. And some of the scenes here in World of Motion are directly lifted from the concept art for Western River Expedition. So they did live to see the light of day. Right. Just like a, like a, a couple other places like the Prairie Dogs and the Buffalo in, uh, in the Land Pavilion, uh, those ideas from Western River Expedition did actually get used in Epcot finally. Amazing Which is a good thing. Because uh, Mark Davis, I mean, the one thing Mark Davis was a genius at, and I think uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of talk and forth, back and forth these days about screens versus audio animatronic figures and what kind of value you can get out of using uh, audio animatronic figures uh, compared to screens. And uh, what we had here was really a really nice blend of it. Um, I, I want to say the style that Mark Davis worked in, I'm going to call it like cinemagraph with sculpture. <laughs> because he didn't have a lot of wildly moving things. Uh, the movements in his stuff was actually quite subtle a lot of times. Um, but it really told the story. Just very subtle shifts of weight or knees buckling or, you know, the Mona Lisa's foot tapping. That really told the story. You didn't have to have someone up doing like grand crazy gestures. Um, just these very subtle motions and then with some screens in the background for the things that had to do like uh, very big motions really told the story of this ride. So so let's jump in uh, and we'll start with foot power because that's yep. that's where we start. Oh, and that and foot power was one of our one of our puzzlers. That's right. And we back. should mention uh, at, in uh, in keeping with the concept of this being a lighthearted look, the uh, the host for the uh, for the show was Gary Owens who was a, a radio announcer from California and was known as being the star of laughing. So uh, right from the start, you're setting the tone that um, that this is going to be fun. Yep. Well, and plus you have the, sun, the, the song, It's Fun to Be Free, which you hear uh, in the queue. So I think you're pretty set up, set up to know that this is going to be a comedy. And we should note, too, that not only the name, not only the song, Fun to Be Free, that that song was, I don't know how many versions of it, but every single room that we're going to go to and talk about here, or, or area, I should say, um, each of these scenes had a specific version of "It's Fun to Be Free." Yeah, much was, like Small World, the whole yeah. Small World idea. But yep. but the idea here was uh, even expansive to the point where I don't know how many versions. I mean, you know, you hear a sitar, not sitar, but you, you hear a piano, a ragtime. You've got you've got the Mississippi uh, riverboat. You've got the twenties flapper type, you know, song. Uh, I don't know how many there were, but that there it was really a, quite an undertaking from from a musical perspective too to. You know, mesh those together as you went from scene to scene. Right. Yeah. And masterfully done. Absolutely. Masterfully have we done. have we ever taken the footsteps, the boop 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 that we had on the audio puzzle and sped it up to see if it plays? It's fun to be free. Ooh. <laughs> Little Beatles stuff there. Huh? Yeah. Or play it backwards and sp- we it says Walt is dead. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have to try to do that. How is our resident uh, audio expert? So we're gonna we're gonna put him on the case for that. Well, oddly enough, we actually do have an audio thing that we're going to do as part of the show in a little bit. So right. so we do have some forensic audio in this, there we in go. this episode. So all right, so foot power. We'll get back to that. So foot power. So we start off uh, and we see uh, something very reminiscent of the the sixty four World's Fair. So so feet are our first mode of transportation. And we have a husband and wife caveman, cavewoman, with their baby and a papoose. Um, they've walked long distances, and the the husband's feet, foot is actually red hot, and he's blowing on it uh, to try to cool it down. 
right? As we heard in the sound. And then the, the woman <laughs> is uh, with a, sort of a disgusted look on her face is sort of using a fan to try to, to cool her feet down. Um, and they're sort of situated in a cave and the baby is, is, is in a little papoose. Um, I believe um, that figure is original. Um, at first, I thought it might have been like the Haunted Mansion uh, woman blowing out the candle. But I saw a nice close-up picture of his face, and it was a was a unique thing. And and I guess that's something I should mention. With with the number of audio animatronic figures that were in this ride, it seems like there were some that were specialty sculpted. Uh, and then there were others that were picked up from previous attractions, much like Spaceship Earth has presidents and things in it. Um, there were a number of of characters from uh, the Carousel of Progress, uh, from the Haunted Mansion, from Pirates of the Caribbean, used as incidental characters. Um, then some unique things too. So, yeah. um, so that's foot power. Then we move on to uh, then there's on the wall. We see some uh, some different uh, examples of early uh, sort of like sailboats and things. And uh, then we move on to water transportation, and we've got a. A different caveman kind of relaxing on a raft, uh, enjoying just getting pushed by water on a on a river. And there's some rushes and things uh, to give you an indication that there's water there. And uh, <laughs> there's an alligator snapping at his feet. So, you know, that that very typical Mark Davis humor um, going on there. And then we round the corner and we end up in Assyria, uh, where Gary Owen says that man is test driving many new models <laughs> of animals. And you see um, sort of a desert scene and there's a, a person on an elephant, a person on an ox. Uh, there's a guy trying to, to get a zebra to move who's loaded down, a person on a camel. Uh, there's a donkey that's overloaded with, uh, with uh, luggage. This is another one of his, the Mark Davis jokes. It's like there's a man who's trading in the donkey who is overly tired and there's a bunch of luggage and his wife like up on the donkey that's basically has its <laughs> legs almost spread out in four. And I, I remember that scene because the poor man's there, he's trying to trade it and he's shaking the, 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 the bag of trying to get every last dime <laughs> yeah. to, out of his bag. I don't it really it kind of, and I but, think, yeah. And I think one of the things that you will see is like, this was very kind of, 60s ish 70s ish humor that like ran through the whole thing which oh, yeah. maybe is what spelled its death you know by the time we got to the 90s um there's another little um funny spot where um there's a the guy on the ostrich is holding a basket of food and the camel is eyeing the food and the guy sort of like pulls it away and then puts it back and pulls it away and puts it back and pulls it away and puts it back um and then there's also a guy on a flying carpet uh who's apparently the one that has really figured it all out. So <laughs> got to contact him today. I don't know. We, yeah. So I haven't just... mastered that technology. Yet. <laughs> uh, I mean, then we... just, it's, it's how I just want to interject it for a second is that, I mean, you just explained one scene. You've got camel, ostrich, zebra, donkey, people trading things, a flying carpet. If that, for those of you who haven't, you know, didn't, weren't fortunate enough to, to be on the ride, we just described one scene and, and that's, it, it just gives you a really idea of how, mass of this was and the and the you had to go through it multiple times to look at other characters again and pick up on all these 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 little jokes and and, and little nuances that were that were thrown into the attraction that's true this is one of those levels of detail upon levels of detail type rides a, a different than horizons horizons was printing the back of the menu that nobody could see this was i almost uh there was that going on here as well but this is almost that that there, there's so much other things going on in the ride that, uh, um, that, that would be missed. Yes. Good, Brian. What's that? Uh, did you have something to say? I said the flying carpets that you were looking for, they're in Adventureland now. <laughs> <laughs> there's still an arm holding them up, though. I'm not impressed yet until they can fly. <laughs> um, so from uh, from animal power, we move on to the invention of the wheel. And this is this one of my scene, one of my favorite scenes. I yeah. always love this one. So in this scene, we move to Babylon. We're in the king's throne room, and sort of down on the bottom, when you come in, there are three inventors. Uh, one of them has a triangular wheel, one has a square wheel, and one has a hexagonal wheel. And there's this kind of tall, very ominous guard-looking guy that's pointing towards the exit, like trying to tell them to leave. And then up a, a little tiny staircase next to the king is the guy with the round wheel who's very proud of himself. And the king is just happy and giggling 
like a little mad guy. Now he's he's he reminded me of the the extra extra read all about it in Spaceship Earth. You could hear him scenes away. <laughs> <laughs> right? I, it's like the audio animatronic character that carried through multiple scenes. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and from there, you went through like a little, almost like a mini speed room, kind of like a little transitional room with projections of wheels just kind of like spitting on the wall. Was there any reason for that, do you think? was there? Were we making a turn? Yeah, there was, that, there was a turn there where we needed to just basically go from one section to another one. It so wasn't they, a clean turn. Didn't want to bore us, so yeah. There's a couple of those, a uh, couple of those in the ride, uh, and in this case, you you got to see like uh, about three or four different styles of wheels um, spinning. So it kind of actually worked to set up the next scene too. Well, it is a transition period, right? We we've gone yeah. away from it, so it's a perfect transition. So yeah, it's a transition through. It's a bigger jump in time, so so a transition is always nice. Uh, then we get to the applications of the wheel. So first, you see. Um, so there's kind of like three little buildings in a row. The first one is an Egyptian style, and you see an actual full-size Egyptian uh, chariot sitting there. And then in the back of that, there's a projection of uh, really nice animation. Um, I don't know if Disney animation did this, but this there's some really nicely um, sections of animation here um, that are very reminiscent of the kind of cycle animation that was done in uh, Ward Kimball's uh, sort of like uh, informative Disneyland specials, uh, and he did a number of of ones on transportation, uh, and a lot of people thought, and even Disney sort of pushed him as being the person that was behind this ride initially. Um, they trotted Ward out during the initial uh, press things, and and not Mark Davis. So, it's possible that he might have had some some suggestions on how to structure this because it was very much like some of the older Disneyland specials. But then Mark ended up actually doing the the final work. But there's just some beautiful animation that was done um, throughout here. So you see an Egyptian uh, on a uh, an animated screen of an Egyptian on a chariot. And then the next thing is a, a beautiful little sort of like Chinese building with a rickshaw out in front. And there was an animation of like a guy pushing a uh, sort of like an emperor looking man uh, on a rickshaw. And then the third one is Rome. And you see sort of like a typical Roman columned building. And there's uh, two urns on other side. And instead of being on the screen there, the the projections are actually done in the urn. So it's sort of in that art style of the time. Um, were those front or rear? Do you, do you know how those they were did? rear? Those were rear. Okay, yeah, because yeah. because they're completely curved, so they must have. Yeah. yeah, very impressive that they kept the perspective too of the of a curvature. So that must have been animated or stretched in a way so that when it hit the curved screen, it looked correct. They had well, they had really good lenses too. So yeah. there was probably kind of fancy lens on the projector, right, uh, right? And that had a centaur. So the joke there was like there was a centaur pulling that. And then in front of that, there was actually audio animatronic figures of a centaur sort of being held uh, uh, by a leash by the shy girl from the Pirates of the Caribbean in the auction scene. <laughs> that centaur freaked me out. But there's our first. Uh, I never liked that scene. <laughs> and uh, first reuse. And just as a as a little bit of trivia, the price on the centaur was M M L X X X I X, which is two thousand and eighty nine. Roman dollars, I guess, whatever oh. that would be. Snap. Inflation yes. calculator, how? Yeah. <laughs> from, <laughs> yeah. That's, from that's, BC. From, from BC, yeah. <laughs> Roman time. We, we'll, we'll, let, we'll, we'll let Brian work on that and get back to us by the end of the mm-hmm. show. Yeah, but by about three podcasts from now. Yeah. <laughs> And then, uh, and then after that, we move on to another big sort of Mark Davis set piece, which was a uh, a used chariot lot. So, uh, so the concept here, again, bringing that sort of '60s '70s humor in, is that uh, that just like we have used car lots today, it's like they would have a used car lot then. Uh, and we go by uh, soldiers who are checking out the Trojan horse uh, to see if they could reuse that. And then up on the uh, up on a precipice, um, there is a. Uh, a fast talking salesman, sort of that old concept of like, oh, it's the fast talking salesman, um, trying to talk uh, the man in a couple, uh, just talking in general about like all sort of the, the bargains that they have. And then uh, there's a woman who is looking at a very expensive gilded sort of uh, sort of transport. And there's another salesman talking to her and he's kind of showing her like how nice the silk is. And he's talking about how uh, 
how uh, uh, Caesar's wife has one of those. <laughs> so the one salesman is talking about is talking completely from the woman's perspective, and the other salesman is talking from like the man's perspective. I th- think about how many times you had to go on the ride to pick this up, right? And, and to yeah. really listen to the dialogue because you got Gary Owens, right? And then you're trying to pick up the dialogue. You've got <laughs> from the last room <laughs> coming over. <you. laughs> That is, but, it was very clever. There were there yeah. were little signs like Savings Maximus and Sale Colossus like up on the walls, and there yeah. were uh, you could see like the prices marked down in Roman numerals <laughs> on some of the the lesser of the chariots they were trying to get rid of. Savings and, Savings Maximus that wasn't a precursor to that horse, was it? Oh, Hal's got a puzzled Max, look on us, Maximus, Maximus from that movie we all had. Uh, oh, yeah, that was a. Yeah, that went right over his head, but yeah, you never and, know. And one of the que- one of the questions that I had about this, which which I'm I'm happy to clear up finally, is there was something that was always kind of weird about this scene. So so there is this sort of you know trope of the fast talking salesman, and if you go back and listen to the audio, uh, the one salesman is talking in a normal tone, but the other one sounds like a chipmunk. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, it's really high pitched. And it does kind of pull you like out of the situation. So I did a little forensic audio work. And um, for the first time, we are going to play for you now the sound of the salesman voice played at the normal pitch. Whoa. Wow. See if we get this queued up here. Here we go. So the question was like, why in the world did they do that? Yeah. And, I, and I think the answer is like they used the same actor for for both uh, for both of the salesmen. So they just had the guy read both sets of lines. Have, was this like a strapped budget that you couldn't use the tee hee 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 man to do that? You know, uh, you know, it could have been him the whole. He could have done every voice. Every voice, yeah. That that that's that's interesting that they. Hmm. So uh, so t- in order for him to be fast talking, they did what was then the normal trick of of changing the speed of the tape uh, because they didn't have digital technology yet that could actually shift pitch. Um, but not change the sp- not change the speed or change the speed, but not change the pitch. So mm-hmm. he gets a chipmunk voice because they just sped the tape up. So so John Mashita of, of FedEx fame uh, was not available for the fast talker. Well, that's see now here's what's interesting. <laughs> micro machine guy. That. Micro yeah, micro machine. Yeah. I remember yeah. Because I thought well that would have been actually a very plausible thing to do to hire that guy because right. he the FedEx uh, spots broke in eighty one. Yeah, this didn't open till eighty two, so he certainly would have been available. And how how much perfect would that have been? Oh yeah. Uh, but it occurred to me that he talked so fast, the audio animatronic lips on that figure <laughs> could never have kept up. That's true. That's so true. I think that was kind of their compromise to do this this sped up voice to try to get that idea of the fast talking salesman, but not actually have be able to do fast talking. So you should have always turned the audio animatronic figure to turn the back to the car, though. See, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, like the new X three X three boy. There we go. So. I don't... <laughs> <laughs> so interesting. Well, what a great, interesting find there. How I appreciate the uh, extra. Yeah. Sometimes you gotta you gotta find out why. Yeah, you yeah. Just gotta know these things. So um, the fans so will appreciate that, it. <laughs> so after uh, so after wheels, we move to sailing ships, uh, and you as you the car kind of shifts around, you see a very large, again beautifully animated and drawn map. This thing is absolutely gorgeous um, of ships uh, uh, coming off of the map. And they hit the edge of the world and kind of fall off. <laughs> That's great. And there's a there's a little painted uh, a little painted thing on the wall that next to that that says Terra Incognita. So you're going into this the world of the known and the old world into the the new world uh, and the unknown. And then there's a very large and this picture has made it around like a million times. You see the very large sea serpent and then Columbus uh, looking through a uh, through a telescope, like directly into the eye of, of the sea serpent. So that's your hilarious Mark Davis joke there. <laughs> <laughs> the classic that everybody's seen. Yeah. And that, um, that, uh, 
that sea serpent is apparently in Paris now at the uh, the Disney Studios. Oh, wow. For whatever reason. <laughs> it's French. They're like, <laughs> we must have the giant drive. <laughs> Uh, and then from from there, we move into the Renaissance and we see uh, Da Vinci's studio. And uh, this this is actually a really great scene. This is staged so well. And again, it, we talk about the subtlety here. So uh, the basic concept is that Leonardo da Vinci, obviously we all know that he was a, was a true Renaissance man and a genius and was interested in a lot of different things. Uh, you know, everything from inventing airships, which he did, to, you know, being a great artist. He learned about anatomy. He was really groundbreaking. So you have the Mona Lisa uh, uh, posing, sitting in a chair with just this really, really angry, frustrated look on her face. Uh, and she's tapping her foot. And you can see uh, the painting, uh, her portrait, just kind of halfway done, uh, sitting there. Uh, and then Leonardo is off in an adjoining room. Um, and he's got a guy uh, like up in some kind of flying contraption on a pulley with another pull in person pulling up and down. And he's studying that to, to try to learn about flight. Um, and it, it it's just really so well staged. In fact, uh, like the half done painting of the Mona Lisa, it, it's not done the way that a person would actually paint something and then walk away from it. You know, usually if you're painting something, particularly in oil, it's like you're going to rough out areas and then work it and work it and work it. And, you know, it might look incomplete but it would still more or less look like a painting this thing is literally like cut on the diagonal at the halfway point <laughs> and it's got where, the, the fake sketches on the bottom which is yeah great. one half of it is completely finished and then the other half of it is like sketched and like partially painted in a little bit but it, it really so communicates that idea yep. so well and the, the look on the guy's face who who, who leonardo has got up in the contraption <laughs> the flying contraption is it's classic because he's just got this look like i don't know if i want to be up here or not <laughs> you know <laughs> So, can you guess where that guy comes from? It's got to be pirates. He is in pirates. Okay. He's somewhere else too. He's somewhere else too. Different, different attraction, same era as pirates. I got nothing. All right. He is also the uh, the uh, caretaker in the haunted mansion. I was going to say home, but yeah, that makes sense. That, that kind of, that kind of surprise, shivering surprise look. Yeah. And he, he gets end up used in a couple other places throughout the ride. So that's interesting. So now here's a funny story about when I was little on this ride. Um, I, I adored it. And I remember going back home and, and, and then going down to Florida another time and going on spaceship earth and I would go through a Renaissance area. And that was, you know, it's got Michelangelo. I'm like, where the hell did Da Vinci go? Where's Da Vinci? It just shows how well those two areas were done. That in my mind they were completely blurred because they they were both left hand side, um, both a very similar lit scene. You know, I, I don't know what for some reason I I always blurred them together, and uh, I remember then I'd go in World of Motion and go, oh okay, Whew, there. Yeah, Bye. well, <laughs> I mean there definitely was some some thematic overlap between oh, yeah. those. Well, I mean, I guess... in Spaceship Earth, you 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 point out the small gags and the small movements. You have the you know the uh, the monk sleeping right behind the manuscript as as you yeah. come by. It's the same same thing here. It's I guess it's just interesting that every ride that is about the future is is mostly like a a ride through history with like just a touch of future at the end. And you actually but... remember the history stuff better, which is <laughs> this is yeah, is what they very strange. Yeah. So, uh, so from from Da Vinci Studio, we move on to lighter than air travel, and uh, there's a projection in that transition of some like balloons and things, and then you see a, a really cool little uh, tableau, which is supposed to be uh, London, with a uh, the gond of a balloon hanging down, with a guy kind of like waving to uh, two women that are coming out of their uh, their Mansour roof uh, windows. Uh, one of them with a the candle, and and I believe the one is probably the girl uh, that had the uh, the candle in the barrel in the Pirates of the Caribbean before she was replaced by Jack Sparrow. Um, and inside of the balloon, he's got a, a pig and a chicken and a dog, because <laughs> all the essentials. Oh, yeah, that's what do you need? <laughs> now, do you know gonna... where that that theme came from? Do you know was that just original to this ride, or is there some backstory to? 
to Wizard of Oz. Oz. Why those animals would be in Yeah, there. yeah. Because that was a real thing that people uh, did back then in the early days. Oh, no, ballooning act- was huge, right. Yeah, everybody, would, they waved everybody and they all go, it was a big spectacle, right? Yeah, I mean, it started uh, It started with animals. Like the first, the first balloons, they actually put, you know, animals in it before people would do it. And then uh, people would get in. There was, I was reading today, there was actually an English guy that bragged because he took a horse with him up in a balloon. And <laughs> I guess whatever that works, was, that was your form of one upmanship is that you maybe people because it was so new, you couldn't get a lot of volunteers to do it. I, I remember reading when the king of France, uh, when they were going to do one of the first balloon rides with people that was com- non tethered in France, the king wanted to put two prisoners in the gondola instead of sending up people and uh the two early aviators basically had a fight for the right to be able to be in there because they wanted to have the historical uh credit not like a couple of of deadbeats so 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 the the, <laughs> the pigs and the chicken are kind of like albert the monkey yeah it's you know. your his name was really yeah. albert yeah albert the monkey is uh, who who went up on the, for the uh some of the early uh space tests in the united states so what we'll, we'll I don't know. Maybe we'll give names to the chicken and the pig here for for future reference. A chimp, a chimpanzee. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then from there we uh, we move on to steam power. So um, you so then kind of take a right, and it looks like you're out in the English countryside. So we go from downtown London to the English countryside, and you can see um, sort of like a Tudor house in the background. And if you look to your left, you'll see where a uh, there's a fence that's been pushed out and the bull has come across the path of your car now, and I, is locked. Go ahead. Just no, just right there. The attention to detail, how many people would look to the left and see that gate? I mean, it was, you know, the way you entered that scene, it, it would help you. But I mean, just, that just shows that they were showing you something on the left that had happened to get to this scene that you're seeing on mm-hmm. the right, not just show us the scene on the right. There, there were things that happened before you arrived, which, just just absolutely brilliant storytelling yeah and the trans uh, the transitions are are remarkably well done um the one thing about this ride compared to some of the other ones uh there are a lot of times where you can see the roof you can see the wall i mean they they didn't have enough budget to really completely cover everything and make it as immersive as some of the other rides but they did a really spectacular job in in what they did do yeah. um with these transition areas this um, is uh, this is one of the scenes. A lot of the aspects of this scene are lifted directly from Western River Expedition. So the uh, so there's this large. I don't even know what this thing is called. It's this large steam powered car. It's like a steam powered stagecoach almost. Right? Yeah, and it's it's going over a bridge, and there's a a bull that's basically locked horns up against <laughs> a, the the car so that it can't go. And then there's a man on the back with a uh, an actual kind of like a bugle-like horn that's blowing uh, to try to get the thing to move. Uh, the people inside are bitching and complaining because they're not going anywhere and they're trying to figure out why. Um, but uh, there's not a lot of motion going on. But one of the really cool details uh, is that uh, not only is there actually like steam coming out of the funnel uh, of the engine on this car – but uh, the bull actually has like smoke coming out of its nostrils, um, angry steam. And it wasn't mild. It, it, it looked good. I mean, it was just yeah. It, yeah, it wasn't just but, a little leak, you know. <laughs> yeah, but again, that whole again that that concept of like oh, when bulls get angry, that steam comes out of their nose, and they you know took that cartoon concept and yeah. really made it happen. That's cool. Yeah, and then. Uh, Oh, and also the bull was anatomically correct. Just going to put that there. <laughs> in case anyone was wondering and wanted to check on that. We'll... <laughs> just in case. Yeah, just in case. Uh, and then from there, we uh, we go from uh, from steam in cars to steam on water. And that means we're going to look at steamboats. So we, we then transition to Mississippi. Uh, and there's sort of like a, a scaled, uh, a scaled down version of a, uh, a uh, steamboat. Uh, docked. It was called the Cotton Queen, uh, and it had windows. And inside of the windows, you could see silhouettes of people like dancing and looking out the windows. It was really probably just like thin metal cutouts that were behind it that were backlit. Um, but it was really effective. I remember in, uh, that scene being very 
tranquil. It was very quiet because it was a nighttime scene. The dock yep. was amazing. You had the planks. You know, there wasn't just a steamboat with with a fake dock. I mean, you had the full planks. You had the cotton bales. If I was there, one hanging overhead too, I believe, or something. Uh, I think you might. That's yep. That might be right. As you come into that scene, there could be one on a yeah. Bench. Yeah, I, 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 I could maybe confuse something else, but I'm pretty sure I remember that. And then, uh, and then there's uh, another man like struggling with the donkey. There's a lot of donkey struggles. Yeah, there's a lot of donkey <laughs> problems. Yeah, They're stubborn. Stubborn is a problem mule. with animals in general, I guess. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> stubborn uh, donkey. That's her. Which that's <laughs> there's that's probably also lifted from Western River. I'm sure there must be a guy struggling with the donkey. Yeah, like somewhere in there. All um, right, now the the you're gonna get to the banjo player, right? Oh yeah, I'll talk about the banjo player. Is he the same one? There's, I mean, American Epcot has Adventure. a banjo player. Yeah, right, it's, it's it's the same one in America Adventure too, right? Is yeah, it it's the same, same one in American Adventure, and he also ends up in the in the end of this uh, playing a ukulele too. So he does everything. Back of the car. He's, he's a well well rounded musician. So. Yeah, yeah, we get we got one, we got one of those. So. <laughs> yeah, so yep, there's a so as you go past the the steamboat, there's the banjo player with a harmonica player. Uh, and the dog from the Pirates of the Caribbean. I was going to say, it, that dog's got to be from... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's kind of howling along with them. Uh, yeah. There's also a boy up on a pillar, like, fishing in the water, which is really nice. And then sort of like a projection of two more steamboats uh, in the background, just to sort of round that out. Um, yeah, really, really cute little little thing. And then from, uh, from the Mississippi, we move to the west. So... Um, the the grass kind of gives way to to um, to the plains, and you see a wagon train circled up. So there's a Conestoga wagon uh, that the top is off of, and then a stagecoach um, circled around. There's a projection on the back wall. Again, beautiful animation from from I guess Disney of uh, Indians going back and forth and then being chased by the cavalry. So they kind of go back and forth. So they're in this perpetual cycle of of being attacked. There's a, a man shooting at them. There's kind of like an older woman packing a rifle to hand off to the guy to continue <laughs> shooting. So as he gets his shots out, she's doing the reloading. Uh, and, and then to add a little humor to it, uh, in that Mark Davis style, there's a guy kind of on the ground that's trying to figure out whether or not it, things are, are still, uh, okay. Or if things are okay to come out. So he's got a hat on a stick and he lifts it up and it's pierced by an arrow. <laughs> And then there's another guy inside of the stagecoach that's kind of like poking his head out of the center window to see what's going on. And then there's an arrow through his bowler hat that's stuck to the stagecoach. And then when he moves down, it sort of hangs there. So, you know, you know, this scene reminds me of something that they did later on in, in Muppet Vision when the arrows came out of the walls to simulate the arrows. I wonder if they ever thought about that for that. where They could, do you know, and they'll. Arrow well, that's, come out. that certainly would have worked better because, I mean, that is one of the things. This was a very that, stagnant scene, right? That gag does not work as well when you're watching the site. I mean, you're watching the entire like two or three cycles of that as you go by. So, I mean, you're not fooled in any way, shape or form that the arrows are are hitting like you are in Muppet Vision. That's brilliant the way they come out of the the walls. That that really that's one of those things that makes that show. So, yep. you know, I, I guess they did, you know, what they could with what they had at that time. Um, oh, and it should be noted that the uh, the stagecoach was an actual Wells Fargo stagecoach that I guess was over 150 years old that they bought huh. in Arizona and brought in. So um, a lot of the stuff they had to manufacture, but a lot of the vehicles they did actually, you know, purchase from antique uh, dealers and such and bring them in for use. That's cool. I wonder yeah. what happened to that after the, it was dismantled, uh, after the ride was dismantled. That is a good question. I mean, that's in John that's, Lasseter's that's a, backyard. Yeah, yeah along with the <laughs> Wilderness <laughs> Railroad. That's every other extinct attraction. Um, hey, at least he's collecting them. We may do something. Yeah. On that right. And then we go to uh, to the steam locomotive. And this this is one of those scenes that is very much... Uh, very much similar to the the holdup that was that was staged for a Western River expedition, and this is a this is a really big room. Uh, so picture like an actual the at least the front three cars of a full size locomotive yeah. sitting in a room. Um, that's that's what you're dealing with here. As as you come around the corner, you can see uh, that the bandits have actually like exploded part of the canyon. 
and the rocks are sitting on the tracks and there's a there's a bandit sitting on top of those rocks pointing his guns at the front of the train as you move to the as the car comes around and you can see the the engine area there's another bandit who has his gun pointed at sort of this carpetbagger type character um, who's got his hands up in the air and uh, his legs, he's knock kneed. He's so scared. His basically his <laughs> knees are like shaking back and forth, <laughs> vibrating, um, which is the same mechanism that's used by the caretaker of the haunted mansion. So they were able to reuse that. <laughs> there he is again. But, but he's this, this great little character uh, because uh, from the whole carpetbagger perspective, you can see that he's kind of a flim flan man and he's got like this, this ace of, uh, ace of spades kind of like hanging out of his pocket like he's a cheat <laughs> and there's kind of like these other cards and his other tricks kind of scattered out on the ground uh again details and then there's kind of like a wealthy couple uh standing behind him that also have their hands up uh and then the engineer of the train is there with his hands up as well uh watching this and then you move a little bit further down the train and uh what i assume is the conductor has a uh, has kind of like a lock box and there's another bandit uh, with one gun pointed at him and then another gun pointed at the lock and he talks about hold, making the guy hold it steady and they actually had an effect when he shot the gun this, there was this kind of like this little great this was explosion yeah uh, light wow. up that would be on there to show that that he actually shot and if i remember correctly there was a, a like a magnetic actuator behind the lock that would push it out so that the lock would jump as oh, if he okay. was shooting it i remember it just popping popping out i i didn't see it in in uh, to see if we could find a better film of it but i remember it popped you know they had a little thing behind it that would push the lock out uh, cool. yeah yeah one of the things that people always used to say is that lock was a hidden mickey and it's not it's i mean it had sort of like that's <laughs> just not <laughs> odd shape like but all locks looked like that at that point it wasn't something that was done specifically um for that and then uh, right next to the, and then the train is basically the back end of the train then is like coming out of a tunnel. So imagine like you see a tunnel, you see this full size train, you see all this stuff going on. And then to the left up in the tunnel is kind of like this good guy, sheriff type fellow, Lone all Ranger. dressed in white <laughs> with a, uh, with a giant star badge, which actually was like, had a light in it. Um, this is probably one of the gags that I don't think worked as well. Um, he just, he just seemed kind of phony and I can't remember right. if he, do you remember Todd, if he like spun his, his six shooters or something? I don't think so. I remember him saying something, but he just didn't, it didn't make the scene because the rest of it, he wasn't doing anything to help. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I guess you were hoping, you know, that he would come in and do something, but he's right. not, he's it wasn't a... as satisfying as a conclusion as, as, you know, maybe no. some other places could have been better. Maybe just make us feel good that oh they're they're going to be safe after all. That's right. So from steam locomotion, then we move on to a different kind of human power, the bicycle, uh, the true melding of man and machine, as they say. And, and <laughs> this is a uh, pretty big room, and it, this is just like one little gag after another. So uh, so apparently, Mark Davis must have thought that bicycles were the worst form of transportation because there is <laughs> nothing good going on here at all. <laughs> There's a uh, oh, there's fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're playing right through magical moments here. We, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> there's a there's a dog that's got a man uh, trapped up in a tree, and he's trying to shake it shake it off uh, shake it off through his leg. Uh, there's a man that's fallen into uh, a pit of mud. This is another one of those like uh, photos that you see all the time. So there's a guy like stuck in mud in sort of like a white Colonel Sanders suit. With some <laughs> totally looks like him. he should be making fried chicken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then a woman is like up on the hill behind him, kind of like laughing at him for for falling down. So, you know, thanks a lot, lady. Mocking yeah. and judging. That's right. She was one of the early YouTubers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> then there's a, a man uh, balancing on a unicycle, which actually this this was a rare thing at the time um, because he was completely freestanding. All the electronics were done through the floor. Yeah, it was a, would, there was just like a little sled, right? Holding the wheel up. It was really. Yeah, amazing, he, so. he would kind of balance back and forth a little bit. He didn't really move that much, but he, you'd kind of see that balancing motion. Uh, and then there is a woman looking up at him who uh, is obviously quite enamored by him. 
And then there's a, a man standing next to him uh, blowing up his bicycle tire, which is uh, getting flat. And he's so pissed off at her looking at him, he's not paying attention. And there's basically like this huge air bubble coming out of the, the top of the tire. Oh, it's going to explode. <laughs> Why going back to the pig? Do you know, why was one of the pig wearing an eye patch? Do we know? In the video, prior to the Caribbean. Yeah, the the dogs. Or is it a bandana or an eye patch or something? Oh man, you know what? Never mind. Take that back. It's just a shadow. Cut that. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Moving on. Pirate, pirate pigs. Pirate pigs. Yeah. That's the episode title now. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, there's your lounge moment. Yep. There we yeah. go. And from there, uh, from the automobile, then we move on to uh, the the automobile. And we see a mechanic um, working uh, on an internal combustion engine trying to get it started. Uh, and he's kind of just playing with it, and you hear it kind of like firing up. And then... I remember uh, that. It would fire up like every couple seconds, right? He, 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 yeah, it was never, quite loud. Yeah, it was. It was like the tee hee You could hear it a while. <laughs> <laughs> every time I say tee hee um, I remember, yeah, he, the guy never got frustrated. Yeah, Start. you kind of... Which is a good quality. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you're a robot. A tinkerer. Yeah. And this, you would kind of go into garage. So this was a separation from the outside to the next scene. Uh, and then as you pass that on your left... There was a uh, a blacksmith and a horse with a really super confused, surprised look on his face. Uh, and then there was a man like who looked like I don't know if he was supposed to be cranking up the engine on this car, but instead of the engine cranking up, like the convertible top would kind of go up and down. Yeah, was it and, the crank would always be on the front? He was cranking it on the side. On the right? side, so, yeah. yeah. But they are showing the the top go up and down, and then the horse is like, "Whoa, what's?" Yeah, so what's, I don't know if that's the humor is supposed to be just like the fact yeah. that that thing's moving. It's so uh, new, he's just confused. Yeah, you know? just like, huh? The yeah. rear projection behind them is like, I don't know, we've seen that type of footage, the, the, probably that same piece a thousand times before, right? With the... Uh, yeah, driving down the cityscape. Cityscape, the old the old cars going over the... It's taken from a trolley. It's, it, it, I, think that's, I think that's a well-known film, actually, now that I think about it. I'm going to have to look that up, but there there was a well-known film that that they did on, on the front of a trolley and went through the street. I want to say Philadelphia, but I could be wrong. Hmm. Well, at that then we will, we will pause where we are in the middle of the ride because we're, we are literally only like halfway through this yeah. ride and it's been, what? Over we're not going to keep going. We got other things to do, places to go, <laughs> people to <laughs> see. <laughs> it's what if I want to learn about the second half of this ride, you're going to have to wait to episode six. Oh. continuation of stubborn donkey. So, yes, we've got we've got so much to do. We got to get to the world's first traffic jam. It's our season-ending cliffhanger. <laughs> so we have right. to put in VHS tape number two. That's of right. The... Flip to the B side. It's, End of yeah. side one. one. Yeah. <laughs> Dang. Yeah. Not only is how you've got all that, you've got the speed tunnels, all the other things that come up, uh, center core, and and without going into too much detail, we've got all the different things that went on down in uh, the trans center too, which there were. Quite quite a bit going on. That's right. Yeah. So I got to talk about my friend Bird and Robot. Bird and Robot. That's right. Like, gosh, I'm so, so excited for the next episode. So for those of you listening, thank you very much. If you have any questions about World of Motion that we can answer in the next episode, episode six, uh, by all means, please send them to podcast at retrodisneyworld.com so that we can read them on the air and uh, answer those questions for you. And uh, with that said, um, all right, guys, let's transition over to uh, the listener mail. Um, JT, uh, what, do we, what do we got this month? Um, we got a cool one from uh, Jeff. Jeff runs a little project, and the website I gathered he sent us is called Tomorrow Sphere. And what he does, mainly what he brought up was digital recreations of the electrical water pageants and you sort of watch them on youtube and they are like a uh i don't want to say light bright looking thing but it, he's got a black background with the different lights going off and sync to the music so it's it's kind of a uh, really you know sharp crystal clear not like a camera on the beach in the 70s look of <laughs> but you know like a legit real like actual thing a recreation of the pageant so he had that and he sent us that a uh, link to that and he did tell us there's some different versions. He's kind of the guru on the electrical water pageant. So 
Um, that's from Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. And I will put uh, maybe his link in the show notes to one of his videos so you can check that out. Kind of yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm JT, looking from from what angle? Uh, I mean, it's just depicting? straight on, straight on, like, straight on. He's and then like he so, like pans. if you were standing like in the contemporary beach, would you be able to see Roy's cabin in the background? <laughs> you know, I'll. I think in version, you know, Mark II, he will have to digitally create the cabin in the background, shimmering off the lights. That's you know, right. The, that's that's a that's a good question. I definitely, uh, yeah, I'm not sure now, what the plan is. <laughs> He mentioned that he did this to, uh, I think he did this in Illustrator, and he's got just a, uh, um, y- you know, basic reflection going on. Um, I-, I didn't hear any music or anything time to it, but what's really interesting is that not only is it very clear he's got the the, the jumping dolphins. I didn't realize how many different versions there were. Um, I didn't either. I think yeah. it was all original, but maybe yeah. slightly because it's got doesn't have like Little Mermaid music now or something, I believe. Uh, so I'm I'm looking out of the nineteen seventy one and there is some sort of yellow mermaid. There are these I can only assume that they're goldfish around two forty five mark or so. Uh then it's got the jumping dolphins as we know, and then it has leaping mermaids with red hair, yellow bodies, yellow bosoms and green bottoms. Uh and we get into the octopus and then there's these fish with teardrop or water going by them uh and then you get the king triton and the stars and stripes so they obviously have changed uh um a number of different things over time and just to give you an idea of his uh, attention to detail too he's got the green marker lights under each you know float if you will marking the starboard side of uh yes which is nice. really impressive too so he's even got that in there so i i think with a little extra rendering a little help of uh some uh, musical archives uh this is a definitely a great rendition uh you know put that all together so we'll get the with we'll the links up and and thanks to uh jeff for sending that in definitely uh uh nice uh nice to have and Hopefully, maybe we'll get him on the show. He can talk a little bit about uh, all the different versions out there. Um, so, yeah. So, Jeff, uh, thanks for sending that in. Um, uh, JT, tell them where they should write to. and if anybody uh, Yeah, them. send us an email if it's you know anything you want to talk about. It could end up on the show, podcast at retrodisneyworld.com. We uh, we love getting your emails, especially you know 4 o'clock in the morning when the phone dings and you got to... A sweet email from somebody asking us a question. So right. definitely, as you said, JT runs to the 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 mailbox every day. Uh, yeah, I check it two, his... three times a day. I'm like, we got to, we need something today. So it's yeah. It's, he's more excited than if you got a little orphan nanny uh, decoder ring. He just runs out there every day. <laughs> some of the emails we do have to decode with the decoder ring. That's right. Plus. There are some. For a future podcast, we'll hold on to those. So, uh, All right. Well, with that said, we're going in to go into uh, what was formerly known as the Audio Puzzler. We're going to rename it here to Audio Rewind, um, just to give a little more thing here to uh, rewinding the tape or the reel-to-reel recorder. So last month, uh, we, we had an overwhelming response uh, to, to the puzzler, which was which was fantastic, and uh, we went through the the correct answer, and we received many answers uh, from a lot of different people. Was the Living Seas? It was the intro song to the uh, uh, Living Seas as you went into the the first film. So, uh, or introduction, I should say. So we have two prizes this month, and uh, Brian, you've got uh, two of them to give away, right? You had the uh, Fab Five uh, frame and the Epcot Fab sticker. Five Rainbow Bright. <laughs> uh, outfits awesome uh, nice framed little five by seven framed uh original epcot photo and then uh an original epcot center sticker to be appropriately placed on your trapper keeper or your vehicle or your bicycle as or your stubborn fit. donkey or your stubborn donkey. If you've got one. Uh, you put on the, the top. plaster right on there so our two winners who got the correct answers, and, and again, these winners were pulled from uh, all the correct answers, pulled randomly. The first winner is Laura Bowles, and she wins the Fab Five photo. And the second Yay. winner is Kelly Pets, <laughs> uh, who wins the Epcot sticker. So thanks Yay. to you. Uh, Kelly, I want a picture tweeted at Retro Disney World yeah. of where you put that sticker, like if you decide to un glue it and put it on your car yeah. you could tape it temporarily if you want I yeah i guess that's true and i think we should ask laura that we want a picture of the fa- we want to see it up on the mantle with the family photos yes next tweet to the to senior yeah. pictures the picture the... tweeted to us uh that would be great so laura and kelly will be in touch with you shortly and we'll get those those prizes out to you so 
Uh, fear not if your name wasn't called, uh, provided you provide a correct answer. Your name has been entered uh, into the big prize at the end of 2015, which is a reproduction Paul Hartley map from www.map.com. And um, let's get into this month's audio rewind here. Uh, let's take a listen as we go forward and uh, see if you guys can guess this one. All right, so if you have an idea what this month's audio rewind answer is, send your guess or correct answer to podcast at retrodisneyworld.com. All correct answers will be entered into a drawing for a prize, and this month's prize, very special here, I'm going to hand, well, not hand make, I have a 3D printer, I'm going to print out a 50 millimeter jar uh, in the shape of Spaceship Earth, so once uh, kind of a unique object, uh, maybe I'll even spray paint it silver for you so uh so with that said uh, and don't forget all correct entries uh will be entered into the drawing for the big prize as we talked about earlier oh, all right so with that let's move on to film restoration uh this portion of the podcast is brought to you by pixel for a thoughtful once in a lifetime gift contact pixel to create pristine digital transfer of some of your old home movies photos videotapes or slides now available in the cloud with the reflect Terra app to get started today visit pixel.com or call 1-800-557-3508 additionally uh if you visit us at retrodisneyworld.com forward slash imageworks there's a coupon there to get an additional 10% off your conversion or digital transfer, and uh, we will do the restoration for you. So uh, this film, guys, uh, Brian, you and I, this is another one we stocked on eBay, isn't it? Yeah, we discovered this one and decided that we would have it at all costs because it has swan boat on ride footage. Exactly, and... Uh, uh, yeah, we 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 bit a lot. It came out nice. Uh, it was a pretty pretty decent find. And, Sorry, uh, don't worry. We're gonna pay that second mortgage off. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and this one is from uh, 1976. Um, it opens. The guy looks like he's on a boat. Uh, he's not, but it, he's bobbing all over the place with the Magic Kingdom. But what I love about it is that at the 25 second mark, 24 second, you you see the Borden's. Boom. Milk and ice cream wagon, which I know we caught in an earlier film that we we had restored and looked at. But that's a really nice, nice blink and it's gone, though. Yeah, it's but got a couple frames of it. And then this is a pretty fast moving film, too. He only again, you know, this kind of harkens back to what I said in earlier episodes, too, where they only had three minutes to record their entire time wasting. Yeah. So they only look at everything dressed up for the bicentennial, though. (laughs) Yeah. Where are you, pal? You jumped ahead. I'm on Main, I'm oh, on main, main Street. street. I'm, I'm on Main Street. I'm yeah, right here. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Right, right at the boat. beginning here, we're at the 40-second mark. You can see the the bunting that Hal's talking about and all oh, the, yeah. all the yeah. red yeah. white bunting. But the other thing is how Black. close the omnibus is to the horse-drawn crop. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it looks That's... like they're going to hit each other. Yeah, and the fire truck's right it. behind it. Yeah, the fire so truck like is about to get There's like a traffic jam right on Main Street. Yeah, quite a mess. I should... I should. Uh, hey, you know what? Is it me or does the woman at the forty-eighth mark look strangely familiar, like the woman in the Epcot film? <laughs> well, I'll nerd out even more. So at okay. the forty-five, at the forty-five uh, mark, there's yeah. one of the the letter boxes that used yeah. to be oh, spread yeah. about. Oh yeah, there it a is. Bit up Main Street. So if, once you read out your postcard, you could like drop it in the mailbox and send it off. Those are. Do you, long, long gone. Do you know how hard it is to buy postcards down there, or buy stamps, or find a place to send anything? Yeah. I had to buy stamps, and I think they sent me over to the Art of Disney. That was the only place over in Epcot to buy them. <laughs> used to have them at Whoa. every cashier. Every yeah. cashier used to have them. Yeah. Jeez. So uh, look at... Th- now, the this guy old- looks at the 58 mark. He does not look very happy to be on the people mover. <laughs> he is just... <laughs> he's got, he doesn't even know what he's missing. But the guy at Pants too seems pretty, pretty... Look at the star jets going around at 103. Oh, I missed that clean view. It's a great shot of the people mover you get the, if you had wings you can see the uh speedway in the background skyway there look now yeah. look at that look at the skyway take a look at home let me pause it here let me get the right mark all right at the 116 mark now i know when the tomorrowland was was being built we've we've seen some other footage and those are pictures of it that the construction wall had the uh 
yellow and orange and, and, and colors to it. Take a look at the spire. Take a look at the tower. Was there yeah, that's more? weird. Where? Yeah. I, I wonder if that's leftover it's, from... Yeah, it's orange, yellow, and, and like an aqua or, or teal. mint teal. Well, you something. know what? The mint at the top is... is this, this film was very, very difficult to restore. I need to go back and, and color adjust it again. So that's probably should really be white. But... Yeah, the two col- the two oranges. What do you think, Hal? What? Well, if you look in that frame, that orange is also is sitting at the top of the wedway in that shot, and that there was a yellow color that was also used to the ceiling of the wedway, and that light blue was all over Tomorrowland. So those are Tomorrowland colors. So you think that's not a restoration issue? That you think that blue was? I there? think that could be accurate. I wow. I have no recollection looking of it looking like that, but that okay, that's I'm very old. likely it. I'm also going to promise that we're going to post a still of this because we're literally talking about a two-second <laughs> frame. frame. Yes, I mean it's a two-second frame. JT, write 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 that note down. We got we got, got it. Sure we get noted the, the freeze frame. So the onboard footage of of the swan boats comes in at uh, around one one twenty or so. Um, now what's interesting is she's sitting there. Actually, it's about one twenty-three. She's got two steering wheels as well as a throttle do you notice that again huh. pause it at 123 and, and they kind of spin back and forth a little bit as she puts the throttle up to pull out um it's a pretty sweet setup was it yeah well, i also like the, the they're... running lights on the inside the, like the lamps that are on the ceiling oh yeah they look like twenty thousand leagues don't they a little bit i mean those you get a great shot at 144 of the curved Adventureland bridge, which is no longer curved. Uh, oh, and it, was no. cur- it was curved up so that the swan boats could fit underneath of it. That thing was a mother to push those steel strollers over. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> two, two subsequent uh, lowerings of it had now have it completely flat. Yep. So, how what do you think that steering system is? They both move simultaneously. Yeah. They... These were, on, these were on tracks. They were. There was also some rumors of some kind of like electric assist steering at one point. Hmm. That that's that's very. Oh yeah, look at that. They just okay. both kind of go like you know both are. It's like it's dual the same. rudders or something. It's very very. Odd. Where where's our? Uh, we worked at Disney in the seventies. People, that's who. Yeah, we need. we're gonna have to have to reach out to them so it's possible so it's possible that the way that the the system might have worked is that there could have been pumps on both sides of the back of the boat Mm -hmm. and you could discreetly steer it by uh by doing the by like manhandling them to like go in a particular direction so they're on a track but you could probably uh, do a little bit of steering which you would have to do um if you were like taking them on and off the track, um, cause the boathouse kind of s- split, uh, there was a bit of a track that like split off and there was a second boathouse over by the juggle cruise boathouse, um, that supported that. So were they, were they cable tethered or was it, do you know, was there, there was, a, so there must've been a little play to them then. Yeah. Yeah. There was a little something that apparently attached to the center track from, from what I kind of have been told, but there's all a right. lot of mysteries around the swan boat still. Yeah. All right. If anybody knows any of those answers to those mysteries, I I, I love the, the you know the view at the two hundred three, two hundred four, two hundred five mark is just uh, to be able to take a boat under the moat of the castle is just pretty amazing. Pretty but again, sweet. blink and you miss it because we're at uh, we're over to the jitney bus very very quickly. But even like that that boat coming in and around the Swiss Family Treehouse. Mm-hmm. And then running parallel um, to Adventureland. That was just great. Yeah. Now, starting at 210, what are the posters on the side of the Jitney bus? Oh. Like, those look like <laughs> you attraction, right now? A attraction posters that have never been posters. seen. Okay, yeah. So there's, so there's a Walt Disney World railroad system. Then the carousel. Monorail. Yep, the carousel, the Grand Prix, Three, the Grand monorail, Prix. Mission to Mars. Mars. Those are. Has anybody reproduced those yet? Those are fantastic. <sighs> Those posters are some of those posters are in the um, art. Oh, what is it called? There's art like a Disney poster Parks. art book. It's the oh, art. really? They are poster art of Disney parks. That's what that's it's called. It. Okay. Oh, okay. Cool. Man, this 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 whole film moves so quick. Every frame, although we probably get to the Jungle Cruise, um, it's 
It's probably got traders of five. Bucks and just, yeah, just some great old adventure land while it was still yeah. pristine. Um, and you're fairly well grown in for five years in, right? I mean, I'm looking yeah. at the elephant at 237, and he everything is it needs a trim actually around him. <laughs> He's getting overtaken. <laughs> the Serengeti's looking a little. Uh, man, this did is the just... captain have the gun in this version? I take oh, it. Oh, absolutely. They oh, did. Yeah. yeah, they didn't go out until what late 80s, early 90s, right? How somewhere in there? Yeah, it was the 90s. Well. Yeah. Man, this is the fastest jungle cruise you will ever be on. It's literally <laughs> every seven, eight frames it's changed. I feel like it's like two forty eight he's shooting a water gun, unless that's a There's Shrunken Sam. Oh now he oh this is great. When you when you're done watching the whirlwind tour of of, of uh the jungle. Of the jungle of the jungle cruise. Yeah. Check out three ten. It's a shot of the old Frontierland station, but with the the sign and it says um Frontier Railroad Station ticket book holders present C in a big, big C to operator, no cash accepted on ride, please no food, drinks or smoking past turnstiles and something So you could smoke in the turnstile I guess, and I guess so. <laughs> Take but. that edge off before your train ride and then <laughs> All right. Check out the hat at 314, too. That thing is sweet. Is that a Budweiser hat? Whoa. Look at that. Budweiser. That is a Budweiser. Isn't it? Yeah. He bought that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's sure is. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a, like a bucket hat. Yeah. It's homemade. Continuing on with our... This is like the six-minute tour of all of... All of uh... And the guy, again, he does not... The one guy looks happy at 330, and the guy in the far side of the train is not <laughs> abused just... about this trip but the guy on the right <laughs> seems to be taking disney content. like yeah, a boss he smiles 332 he gives a nice nod and smile to the camera he's he, by clearly, the way this is clearly here for his wife <laughs> this is probably going to be us in another 40 years just put that out there now exactly but we're going to be grumping about the way it was <laughs> what is all this crap now can't use these c tickets anymore it's right yeah <laughs> it's it's really neat to see too at um I mean, how much you can see into the uh, rivers of America, and you there's there's the yeah, keel keel boats trip. going around at three forty five, and then you really see the the curve of the train at three forty seven too, the track. Some the, great ride along footage a little further in here, about four four and a half four minutes uh, for the Grand Prix, with the train riding run right, right alongside. Oh, them. that was so. This is seventy six. So. Uh, so what's well, now, the length of the track? Back to that. Hold on. Before we get to that, look at the 40, 40, where is it? Starting at 359. Yeah, that dirty bridge. The dirty bridge. So that's, where is that, Hal? That, uh, it's so that, that's that's backstage, and that actually can take cars uh, into the back parking lot. So that's like into the cast parking. Back corner of, of uh, 20,000 Leagues, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's where that, okay. Now, is that? Where is that today? Uh, it's got to still be there. It's probably well, no. Just better. It goes under now, I think. Yeah, it goes under. It goes oh. under. Oh, so this is an interesting. Wow. We're Quick, going to look at an overhead map of the railroad. All right, Brian's taking care of this as we as we move through. He's going to do some sleuthing. We may have to come back to this. But you're right, Brian. Dirty. Bridge. That is a great ride along of of the speedway for about three and a. Three point one. Really get a sense of the speed of the speedway. <laughs> and I saw, oh, and here's some proof. Like here, I saw an interesting thing on Twitter this week. Uh, someone was saying that the ends of the Contemporary Hotel did not have glass on them when the hotel opened. What? Really? It was completely open air. Okay. Which I have absolutely. That doesn't sound right at all. No. You know, and, U.S. Steel had their act together. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and there's... here I can. Here I can see there's glass in 76, but... Yeah, but can you imagine making a chest of drawers without <laughs> any glass? I mean... Just how hot all chests of drawers yeah. have glass sides. Or I should say all, all... I should say making a chest of drawers without sides. It just wouldn't be... Wouldn't yeah, be. The, yeah. uh, that, that bridge is still there. You still ride it's under it, and it's right at the curve before you come up to uh, New Fantasyland, before Storybook yeah. Circus. So is it right, so, so overgrown that you just... I think it's, yeah, I mean, there's so much foliage around each side of it now. But if you look at an overhead satellite picture, you can see you still go oh, right look under at that. It is still there, but you just, 
you just don't you probably don't even realize it's there. It looks a little bigger, but well, I, I think it looks like along. a trestle. I think they have it disguised as a trestle, so when you're going under it, it looks like a railroad bridge over you. Right. right. Somebody right. send us a picture, tweet it at us on the train this week. Yeah. You know, I was funny, Brian. We said go under. I was thinking, I was thinking of the spot where, by Little Mermaid, where I'm, where I'm sorry, actually, by the BR Guest Restaurant, where it starts to go under. But yeah, yeah, makes you realize how far. Uh, looking at that satellite view, how far out the train really does go in the park when it goes yeah. by, that, by that river. You forget. So, all right. So where, where are we in the film here? Uh, the great about to- four, to- about, I was gonna say yeah, four yeah. sixteen. You can see some topiaries on Topiary Lane. Yeah. Now it's is that? Uh, is that one of the Osceola steam wheelers, or is that the? No, that's the regular one, huh? Uh, yeah, that looks yeah. like a regular one. It looks like we're pulling into Main Street very quickly. Yep, side of the Walt Disney Story. Now look at look at the color of the building there too. Um, at four twenty, four twenty seven. Is that that's the um? Is that what is that there? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Oh, well, that's the that's theater the, to the that's right. The, the cinema. Plaza Restaurant, the side of it. Oh. But look at the colors. Yep, yep, yep. Huh? It's like a like a gray really? with the blue. No, that can't be because that's no. That's, that's West not, Street. That, that's the one of the markets. That's one of the side, side streets. Down. Okay, okay. That is that West Street or East Street? Yeah. Well, it's East Street because there's the cinema. Okay. Yep. He's standing in West Street and panning. And now we're seeing the flowers in West Street. And there's a great shot at 437 of what is now, you'd be in the Emporium, the connection, that big glass thing or whatever you call it. Wow, all the flowers, the old barber shop. Yeah. What I always say, we find pictures of this all the time. Literally every set of photos or film that you buy from someone who was there in the 70s and 80s, there's pictures of the flower market. Yep. So it's good that Disney got rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't selling anyways. Yeah, I mean, it's just, That's I great. mean, literally every single set, there's a family photo in there. There's film footage of people in there. Good thing they got rid That's of right. it. That's right. Yeah, I don't know How if they sold any flowers. flowers. Yeah, yeah. That's, it was just a photo spot. That was it. It wasn't worth it. I don't, you know, it's one of those things. Well, maybe it's, oh, no, no, people hold, on, buy hold, flowers? hold on. No, there is another film that we have that I restored, taken at almost the exact same location, and the girl purchases flowers and has them in her hand. So oh, we, we will review that one coming up. Wow. Yeah. So. Send oh my people. gosh! Hold on a second here. Okay, so yeah. at four forty-six, this could this is a bunch of people's holy grails. Yes, it is. And uh, get your inflation calculator out, Brian. So, so what we have here is someone shot the signs that the brown signs that you'd come and see as you drive into Walt Disney World. And why this so is on the, the end of the reel, don't ask me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what. So there's the Welcome to Disney World sign. Yeah. The parking cents. two miles. Yeah. All right, Brian. So give it to us here. Car, it was a 76, right? Right. What do we got there? How can you read? Uh... So cars are 50 cents. No. Campers uh, and trailers are a dollar. And buses well, are... 50 oops, cents, $5. man. That's five dollars. Wow, yeah. So 50 cents was $2.05. A dollar was four eleven, And five dollars was $20.54. Well. Wow. So, wait a minute. So you're saying that now a dollar... It would have been two dollars nowadays. To park. park a car. That's all it's gone up. Wow. Yeah, and what is it now? 17? We're a little over inflation. I don't, I don't know. I, I always stay on property, so I don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's 17. 17 or 18, something like that. Wow. Parking two and, miles, too. So this is taken... Because, yeah, I mean, World Drive was a desolate yeah. drive. You didn't so know. prep people. It, did I make it will their... be again, too. The, the Speedway will have more parking now. Look at that. Bring it and back. And the, the third sign says accommodations available at Walt Disney World Hotels. Registration ahead. Um, the only thing it doesn't have is the one showing the radio, like the AM oh, radio yeah. station. To tune. Yeah, turn on your radio. Which way we determined that was 1300 AM. Is that what it was? When did that disappear? It wasn't too long ago. Really? Yeah, it wasn't too long ago. Probably when smartphones really started. Yeah. It's too bad. So it ends with a nice. Is that? Is that very Liberty good one? Bell good purchase. Is that? Oh, 
Oh, yeah. What is it? Is it? I think it's the Liberty Bell. I don't. It's moving, so it. Yeah, and it's blowing steam, so it's. It's not, got it's one not, stack, so now I got to yeah. go back and do my. Uh... It's definitely the Empress. Uh, not the. It's not the Empress Lily. It's the Admiral Fowler, right? I got to see which one was one stack. I can't remember now. I believe it was the Fowler. It's like you know camels. <laughs> one's got one stack, and one's got two. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're pausing at this time. Why, how while well, looks counts for smokestacks? <laughs> so, if you have any sweet footage like that and you want to just send it to us for free, do yeah, it. Yeah, you know, there's the holy grails that we're looking for out there, and and you know, we've talked about them before. the The wave machine. Um, we've also, uh, you know, looking for any other old footage inside the Magic Kingdom, any footage of Epcot that you have on film. Even if you have very, very early video, we'd certainly be interested in taking a look and, and helping you get that stuff restored. So let us know. Yeah, let us know if you've got it. We'll uh, chat. How it seems to still be. Uh, we're going to start to close out the show, and I'm he'll, sure he'll pipe in with the with the correct answer here. I, I so, must find out. Yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> he'll pipe in because there's one pipe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that ends our film restoration portion. Again, that's brought to you by Pixel. Give them a call at 1-800-557-3508. And again, if you would like to uh, utilize a 10% off coupon, and as well, we here at Retro Disney World will do free restoration of your transfers. Check us out at RetroDisneyWorld.com forward slash ImageWorks. So with that, uh, we do have to close out here. Uh, once again, we appreciate all of our listeners for listening. Um, appreciate uh, all the reviews and, and, and uh, the great response that we've been receiving. Uh, keep the emails coming. Keep sending it to us. And uh, we will look forward to uh, hearing from you and reading any questions that you have on the air. So, um, how do you have an answer here before? Oh, it is the Richard F. Irvine. It was the Richard F. Irvine. Boom. Which is okay. which is now the Liberty Bell. But now the Liberty Bell. Okay. So, well, that has yeah two stacks though. I thought the in the picture have one. <laughs> <laughs> on that bombshell. Exactly. <laughs> well, we'll get back to you next month on that. So, um, anyway, well, as always, you can also find us at uh, on Twitter at at retro wdw and uh, js uh, yes, uh, jt brian and how tell them where we can find you. You can find me on Twitter at brian p miles. I'm you on could... Twitter at LS1JT. And also follow us on Instagram. Retro WDW, I think, is the name. And we post random pictures and that sort of stuff on there. Awesome. And you can find me on Twitter at GoAwayGreen, a, a new Twitter handle. Yes. Yeah, so, I uh, saw that. That's exciting. Changed it on me. It really he really hates the color green. <laughs> <laughs> I miss Liquid Luau, though. It was very... I know. I like that, too. Yeah. Well, how is on a mission? And, uh, until next time, uh, Brian, take us out. Until next time, please stand clear of the doors. Por favor, manténganse alejado de las puertas. <laughs> Don't you be free